Generating currency in Path of Exile has never been easier. There has never been a more generous league in the history of this game than Affliction League. The league mechanic interacts with other league mechanics, magic find, and rare conversion mobs to create enormous explosions of currency, scarabs, and valuable items. Hi, it's Lerald, and I'm going to show what I've been doing recently to make an absolutely massive amount of currency over the past few weeks with my Magic Find Chieftain Auto Bomber. I've gotten a lot of questions about the farm strategy that I've been using on that video, and this is a companion piece to it. You can run this strategy with any character that can handle it, and you can modify tons of things, basically whatever you like. That's what's so great about in-game strategies in PoE. You have tons of freedom to make changes as you see fit. You don't need Magic Find gear to run this strategy, but it really helps make this consistently profitable. Having increased item quantity and increased item rarity on your character really increases the amount of rewards you get from the league mechanic, and they have a multiplicative effect on each other, so the return for having, let's say, 50% increased item quantity isn't 50% more stuff, it's several times more stuff. I have done this content without Magic Find gear, non-Magic Find character. It totally works, it's just not very consistent. You might lose currency for a couple of maps or even a couple of hours and then make it all up and more in a single map but by having magic find gear you're basically always making currency even in very unlucky maps like really bad ones i feel like i've never actually lost money doing this strategy so now let's talk about what the strategy is what are we trying to do here some rares convert all their drops into a specific type of drop. This is why sometimes you'll kill a rare and you'll get an explosion of fractured items or six linked items or scarabs or currency we are fishing for scarab and currency conversions. We want to force as many rares onto each map as we possibly can. We don't really care about speeding through maps at all, we care about killing as many rares as we can per hour. This means that stuff that scales with speedy map completion like getting invitations or Elder Slayer maps from the map boss or running through essences as quickly as we can, that's all basically worthless in this strategy. Maps could take anywhere from 8 to like 25 minutes, depending on how juicy they are, how well I play, whether I go AFK and make a sandwich in the middle of the map or something, whether I stop to trade with people, that sort of thing. And so for that reason, simpler content is better. The less complicated it is, the quicker we can do it. Abyss is good, strong boxes are good, Einhar beasts are good, Ritual is good, Harbingers are actually pretty good in this situation. Expedition is not great. The mechanic is fine, I like the way that it spawns a bunch of guys real quickly, but avoiding reliquaries that make enemies fire immune or uh, not ignitable is very annoying for my build. It kind of wastes time. Legion and Blight are both surprisingly good for this build, I really wasn't expecting that, but they actually are. I like them a lot, I just don't think they're quite as good as Abyss. So now let's talk about the Atlas strategy. I've got my Atlas tree pulled up here, and we're using a Wandering Path strategy. This allows us to get double effect from these quant and rarity nodes here in this sort of the middle of the tree and from all of the map effect nodes at the top hat of the tree and those increase quantity and rarity as well. We also take seventh gate here and then all of the associated gateways so that we can push uh, abyss onto our map device. You can also do this if you're doing a strong box or a legion setup. I think you would still want to force that onto your map device. Abyss is our preferred league mechanic. It just works really well with Wandering Path. Like, there are some good notables in the Abyss, whatever, clusters, but the small nodes, the small passives, add so many extra monsters, so much extra stuff for us to kill, that that is really why Abyss is so great. Beyond is also a really, really good option that is not reliant on having good notables. The only real mandatory node from Beyond is taking Endless Tide so that it is permanently active in your maps. You're never spawning unique bosses, which slow you down quite a bit and are not rewarding proportional to the amount of time that they'll take to kill them. And so that's really good stuff. We are using... Um, we are using a Beyond Sextant to force that on rather than trying to get that from maps or anything. Beyond adds just a ton of rares to maps. They also have increased quantity due to these nodes up here, and they drop a lot of currency. We also take Delirium 
uh, the notable specifically. We take Unending Nightmare so that Delirium Fog and Maps never dissipates. This does mean that we can't get Orbs or Splinters, but that's really fine. Again, we might only be clearing, if things are going well, maps are going to be taking a while, so we might only be clearing two or three maps an hour. I, I can live without two or three Delirium Orbs per hour in order to have permanent fog. Basically, it turns your mirrors into Delirium Orbs, just a randomly chosen one, which is great. Saves you a lot of money in rolling maps. And we also take Singular Focus, the map focus notable. This makes it so we're very, very easily able to sustain maps. This means for map rolling, we can blow through a lot of maps and still have more maps than we could possibly use. I have sold hundreds of maps by doing this strategy. So this has worked out really well as a pretty good money maker as well. Each map you pick up is worth like six chaos if you're selling in bulk really quickly. So actually just picking up maps is a pretty decent strategy for making a lot of extra currency as well. And we're also taking a few Harbinger nodes. Harbingers aren't like amazing or anything. They're just, they spawn a lot of easy enemies. It adds a lot of rares to maps. They do drop a lot of maps as well. And as we know, maps are sort of free currency, so that's good. And since we have Wandering Path, we're not getting any King Harbingers from First Wave. We're not getting any uh, occasional full currency drops from Unspeakable Offensive. I think I have those right. Uh, so we're really not getting very many Fracturing Shards. We're really not getting a ton of currency out of the Harbingers themselves. The main thing we're looking for is just for them to add a bunch of guys. So we can blow those guys up and then spawn more Beyond guys. And then that's even more guys on top of the guys that we're killing. It's all good stuff but just not actually engaging with harbingers like as they probably were intended and that's fine we're also taking ritual we're basically just taking like all of the nodes that increase the chance to get a ritual just these very little dinky nodes here and then we are taking these couple of nodes here increase ritual intensity 40 percent increased number of spawn monster at once and faster ritual so just making them go faster Ritual's not like super special on its own, really. I'm not a huge fan of it. As a league mechanic itself, it's just a free second chance to kill some enemies. That's the main draw. It's cheap juice. Maybe you get lucky and you get an insane synth base out of a ritual that's worth like 10 mirrors. But in my experience, I haven't gotten anything worth even a single divine from ritual this league. And, and that's fine. The bonus nodes that increase the spawn rate are really like what make it appealing to me. You can drop these, but I've played around with not having it and it did feel like quite a lot slower. I really hated it. And I think it's pretty quick with those. I thought about coming down here and taking these nodes to get another 30% chance, but that's a lot of travel nodes to get down here. And I didn't really want to give up some of the other stuff like you'd have to give up Harbinger chance and then something else in the tree. And that some of that something else is Einhar nodes. Red Beasts add a lot of quantity and rarity onto those uh, onto those mobs. And so I kind of like investing in adding even more juice onto my Einhar squeeze. So we take these six nodes in here that give us a 10% chance each for an additional Red Beast. So 60% chance for an additional high quantity rare mob in our maps. And then we take these two nodes over here that give an 8% chance each for Red Beasts to appear in pairs. So that basically means 16% more Red Beasts. Like sometimes you'll get uh, doubled red beasts for your map, which is pretty great. That's a lot of rares being added to your map that have high quantity, high rarity on them. I have gotten some pretty good like divine explosions off of uh, off of red beasts, more scarab explosions, but you know, still pretty good. There is another node down here that I have chosen not to take, and that is this pair of nodes here that give two additional yellow beasts. I played around with this for a lot. It really filled up my menagerie quickly. Now you can just go there and release the beasts without putting them in a, in a Pokeball and it's fine, but it's just a time waster. Like I will literally show off what I was doing here, going to my menagerie, talking to Einhar, viewing the bestiary, opening up the captured beast tab, and then just looking for, okay, this is a rare beast. It just, it doesn't have an icon. It's just a yellow beast. And just doing this and i mean i did this for literally hundreds of mobs you can actually hit enter to accept that dialog box tedious so forcing myself to not have to deal with that tedium quite as often is good you will eventually fill up your menagerie doing this strategy i've done it numerous times and having these two nodes here makes that quite a bit faster and more importantly the yellow beasts i don't think i've ever gotten a single 
uh, interesting currency explosion off of a yellow beast. They don't add a lot of rarity and quantity. They do add a couple of rares, but I think the most I've ever gotten from one is like a divine ever. So why not strong boxes? Just to answer a couple of questions here, why not do strong boxes? I tried it. I liked strong boxes a lot. I actually thought it was more fun to play with than Abyss. It's cheaper and it's simpler and it requires a lot fewer passive points. The problem is that it's not as good. It's just not as good for making currency. It's more fun, probably more consistent, but it takes two sextants, which makes it a lot more constraining on the rest of your strategy than taking Abyss. Why not Legion? I played around with Legion as well. I had zero expectation for this strategy to be good with Legion, and then it has wound up being actually surprisingly so. And I like it a lot. I think the problem I have with it is I just didn't find it was quite as profitable as Abyss either. And if you run into Legion bosses, those guys can kind of be walls. They can kind of take a while to kill. Not necessarily. Sometimes you get lucky and you get a good set of explosions, a good ignite, and you can kill a Legion boss in like a second and a half. But it's not as consistent as killing Abyss rares. It's also on the opposite side of the tree from most of these nodes that we want here, like the Beyond, like the... I guess more beyond the ritual, the delirium stuff. So like if we dropped all the Einhar stuff and all of the Harbinger stuff, we could take some of the Legion nodes, but we couldn't take all of the ones that I wanted, like some of these down here. And so I just wasn't thrilled with kind of doing a half hearted job of picking up Legion nodes. So I just skipped it entirely. As for Breach, Delirium, uh, all of the other leagues, um, Breach, I feel like you really have some great notable passives in the breach areas and we're taking wandering paths so we can't get those the same goes for delirium taking things like compulsive hoarder or imagined pursuits or uh the delirium orb reward chance all that's great but that has i mean unending nightmare makes it so you can't get deli orbs so that immediately doesn't work and then all of the other things that make delirium good as like a specific delirium farming strategy you would want notables for and that doesn't work with wandering path and we would lose so much quantity and rarity by not being Wandering Path that it would ultimately lose us currency to drop Wandering Path and try to take notables for... Uh, I mean, it's just a completely different strategy that wouldn't make as much currency with the setup that we have. All right, now let's talk about Scarabs. The Scarabs that we're using are Reliquary Scarabs, and we don't really care about getting more uniques from the Reliquary Scarabs. Instead, what they do is they make the conversion explosions from rare mobs bigger. Winged Scarabs are expensive, especially Winged Reliquary Scarabs. They're worth it, ultimately. Gilded Scarabs will work on a budget, but the number one thing you can do to upgrade making currency with this strategy long term, making your Scarab and currency explosions bigger, is using Winged Reliquary Scarabs. We also use Abyss Scarabs. Just to pull some out here, we use Abyss, Harbinger, and Bestiary Scarabs. So we are we are using Abyss Scarabs. Once again, winged are more expensive, they're better, but gilded are very cheap and you know, they're good enough, at least early on in doing this strategy. Winged are worth it once you're fully committed to juicing as hard as you possibly can, but gilded totally work until that point. And the reason we like Abyss and we like the Abyss Scarabs is for one, uh, the last line there, Abysses in the area that do not lead to an Abyssal Depths lead to a Stygian Spire. I don't know that I've seen maybe one Abyssal Depths in doing this strategy for a couple of weeks now. Almost never see anything but Stygian Spires, which is great. You also get tons of monsters. You just get so many rares, so many currency explosions and Scarab explosions from having Abyss in your maps. Bestiary Scarabs, we like those because they guarantee Einhar, so you're not getting any betrayal guys joining in and trying to kill you. You also get a bunch of high quantity rares to be added into each map, which is great. Winged really isn't necessary. You get three without it being winged, like just gilded, and that's so incredibly cheap to just run gilded Scarabs this league that that's totally fine for Bestiary and for Harbinger. Again, Harbingers just add a bunch of easy rare packs into each map. It's the simplest option, and it's super cheap. You could run Divination Scarabs instead of Harbinger Scarabs. I think that would be fine as well. I just kind of like having more guys to kill. If you run a different strat, such as Legion or Strong Boxes, and you aren't running Abysses, then obviously you would drop Abyss, and you would run either like Ambush Scarabs or Legion Scarabs. You can run Polished Legion Scarabs. That's kind of the more expensive of the lower end strategies. I mean, they sell for quite a bit, but they, they don't have generals in them, which means there actually is more reward to it. By not having generals, you have more sergeants, and sergeants have higher reward chance than generals for some reason. 
Alternatively, you could just run winged. I think winged is probably worth it for Legion. You get two extra legions per map, so they're very rewarding if you're fully juicing. Winged ambush scarabs just give you uh, four additional strong boxes, nine instead of five. Not quite as good of a return on investment. I think still worth using if you're going full juice mode, but not de definitely like the most decadent overpay option there as far as scarabs go. All right, now let's move on to talking about sextants. Now, the sextants we're using, obviously, we're going to use an abyss sextant. That's kind of self-explanatory. Next, we're using beyond sextants, which I mentioned before. We're taking all these beyond nodes in the tree, right? So it would be irresponsible of us not to force beyond onto every map. And the best way to do that is through the sextant. They are quite expensive, about 100 chaos each. But for four maps, that's 25 chaos a piece. You're definitely going to be making way more than that back from beyond. And unlike forcing beyond on with the map device, using the sextant gives you 25% increase beyond even pack size in your maps, which is, I mean, it really adds a lot of guys. So the sextant is very, very preferable. I mean, that is why it's expensive. We also take delirium mirror sextants. That's another kind of non-negotiable option here. Ultimately, the delirium mirror sextants, they add a ton of quantity. They add a ton of enemies. It's great. There's only really one downside. Delirium makes the game ugly. Despite Path of Exile's ugly start like 10 or 12 years ago, I really like the way this game looks now. I think it's very pretty at a lot of times, and I hate that Delirium makes it so ugly and just like grayscale. My big hope for the future, probably more than anything else really, is that layering Delirium over everything else becomes an option for high-end juicing with, you know, some alternative available that's not so hideous, rather than a requirement, because I really don't like the way that it makes the game look so bad. And then finally, you have a flex option. I've been using 25% increased magic pack size. It's just my favorite choice, but there are a lot of good alternatives. You could do 25% pack size in unID'd maps. That's a really good one. You do have to specifically roll your maps to be unID'd, but you can do that. Um, rare maps have more rare packs. That's a really good obvious choice as well. Basically, any type of sextant that just adds more dudes. You can do Legion instead of Abyss, you know, if you're doing Legion. You could do Legion instead of Abyss. I think if you wanted to do a hybrid Abyss Legion strategy, you could drop the increased magic pack size for a Legion sextant. That would make sense. The biggest problem with doing strong boxes, let's see if I have some here. I don't. I think I used all of my strong box sextants up. That's fine. The biggest problem with strong boxes is that you want to run two sextants, one for corrupting strong boxes, which adds two strong boxes. More importantly, makes them all rare and corrupted. And then a second that adds Strongbox monsters have 500% increased item quantity, which is why that strategy is good in the first place. The main reason I'm not doing Strongbox instead of Abyss is because it puts so much more pressure on your sextants. You only have, I mean, you have the one for Mirror of Delirium, one for Beyond. Those are kind of locked in. Then you have the two Strongbox ones. That's it. You don't have another place to put any more, uh, no more free space for sextants. So not my favorite. Now let's talk about our preferred map. We're using Jungle Valley. Why? Well, the main reason is that the boss doesn't spawn until you enter her boss room. Eldritch Altars always spawn with player options, so we always want to take the player option. You can check for Divine Orbs from Minions as one of the options from the Eldritch Altars. I, I have not seen it since doing this strategy. I actually have seen it this league. I saw it twice and I got one Divine Orb between the two altars. <laughs> it is. It sucked, uh, but it basically never spawns. I think it's only like the third or fourth time I've ever seen it as an option. And there are tons of great player altar bonuses, like just to rank them. I think the best one is currency duplication. Thin quant and rarity is really good. Scarab duplication and div card duplication are also pretty good. And then unique and map duplication. Those are the ones that kind of suck. But I mean, again, you're not choosing between player options. You're just taking whatever player option comes up. And that's why you kind of want to build a build that can handle all of the downsides from taking the player options because some of them can be pretty nasty. The other reasons we like Jungle Valley, it's a good layout, very open. You can do easily, easily do any league mechanic. You're talking Abyss or Legion, you know, Strongbox, you can do that anywhere. But Abyss and Legion, you can do really easily in Jungle Valley. So that's great. It also is just a map full of mobs, which is good for our strategy. And it has a couple of good uh, div cards in it. 
It has the Fortunate, which is a very common div card. It gives two divs for 12 cards. Not necessarily good enough to justify Divination Scarabs, I think, but you could try that instead of Harbinger Scarabs. I think the results would probably be pretty similar. Harbinger Scarabs are actually more expensive right now, so I would think about playing around with this if you wanted to just get experimental. And there's also another card in there. Let's see if I have one in my bank here the scout all right here we go yeah eight cards for seven exalted orbs not an amazing currency generator but having exalted orbs on hand is convenient and this will add a lot of exalted orbs to your stash over time like i have over 150 exalted orbs i've had maybe no definitely less than half that many before i started doing this strat so that's pretty good in terms of favored maps, we run 11 Jungle Valleys and then one Mesa or Mud Geyser. So Jungle Valley is here and you just want to run one adjacent map. So it could be Mesa, Mud Geyser or Arid Lake as your favorited adjacent map. And the reason we do that is because of Singular Focus. If you're locking in all on one map with Singular Focus, you'll actually get fewer maps than if you favorite one adjacent map. Just favoriting one adjacent map will give you more maps overall, more of the chosen map, weirdly. Now, if you're not doing singular focus, which we are, we don't want just a random scattering of maps, but if you weren't, you could just run all Jungle Valley and that would be fine. We way over sustain maps with this strategy. I bulk sell maps through the map tab. I'll even show that just the way that I do that here. Just type in Jung. Right. And so what I do here is I just set an exact price on all items. I, you know, I right click and make this tab public, set an exact price on all items. And then I just type in like 120 divided by 20. And that means people will be able to buy them from me 20 at a time for 120 chaos. So six chaos each, but they have to buy 20 at a time. So I don't get people trying to buy one map at a time, which is quite irritating. These sell really quickly, uh, generally speaking, maybe, you, you know, Prices can fluctuate. Maybe you would want to go like 110 per 20. But either way, like I've I've filled up many times. I have a whole overflow tab dedicated to it that I've emptied out a couple of times now. Um, but like, like I said, I've sold hundreds and hundreds of Jungle Valley maps to other people doing this strategy, and it's very, very profitable. Like at the start of doing this strategy, I had a lot more defined, so I just blew them all on a upcoming build. Uh, but I had maybe 800 chaos, and as you can see, I've, I've been just throwing chaos away left and right, and I have over a, over a full stack of chaos just from doing this strategy recently. Now, in terms of rolling maps, I set up a separate map tab here and actually I've run out of all of my maps so that's great I can do a little demo here so what I do is I just take all my maps that I want to roll and I throw them into a separate map tab nice and slow okay so uh, I ID all these and then I'm gonna scour and chisel everything down and we're gonna walk through this here we'll just walk through it Make sure everything's nice and scoured. Okay, great. Now I'll chisel everything up, make sure it's all 20 quality. I don't need to do all these at once. We'll do, we'll do 12 at a time just to kind of show off. All right. So I'll throw all this currency up in there. And then what I will do is I will pull up my regex here poe.re and this is the regex that i use no regen minus max res less recovery reduced effective auras and chance to avoid elements i want to avoid all of those and i want to have at least 80 quantity so i slap that in here and then we're just going to roll these top 12 maps here and okay <laughs> pretty unlucky initial roll that's fine though and I just roll these until they all light up, essentially. All right, last one. Great. Okay, now I like to look for Proj. Wow, we have three different plus Proj maps. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, so whenever you find a plus Proj map, I like to take these and I like to pull them off to the side and then just take some exalted orbs and just check and just see like, can I throw these on here and get these up to six mods? and hopefully not get any uh, build disabling mods along the way. 
but I just want to get these up to plus six, you know, six mods, six mod maps, and then not do anything else with them. I'm not going to corrupt these plus two proj uh, maps. All right, great. That's that's excellent. We love to see that chance to avoid. Poison. All right, great. OK, these four maps are really nice. OK, as for the other maps, I just like to corrupt them like I'll do the full rollout, roll them all out, get them all good. And then I'm not going to exalt a non proj map up. I'm just going to tap them all with uh, with full orbs and hope that they hope that they don't roll down to like worse mods, like 60 percent quantity or something. If they do, I would take that and I would throw that away. Uh, if they turn into Vault Temple, I just throw that into my Vault Temple tab. And then if they turn into something where it has mods that I either don't want to do or can't do, no regen, minus max res, something like that, I throw them over into an... I probably... Sh usually I throw them into the other side of the tab. I think I've reached the point where I need to consolidate this tab into a different tab. But, you know, that's a problem for another time. Okay, so that's how we roll up a map. And then once we do that, we take whatever map we want to run and we head over to the map device and we just check it. Like we throw the map in, we check the scarabs, winged reliquary, ring, winged abyss, gilded uh, bestiary and harbinger. We make sure that the map device is set to abyss. We make sure that the eater is selected. We do just take like five seconds to make sure everything's right. Make sure the sextants are all right. Especially at the start of a farm strategy, I'll just make sure, make sure I haven't messed anything up. Make sure my gear is all right. Farm favored map slots, all that stuff is good. And then we jump into the map. All right, so now I'm just going to talk about what I do while I'm in a map. First things first, I walk through the deli mirror. I want to go ahead and get that popped as soon as I can. And then I jump into the wildwood. I try to carefully clear it out. The wildwood has four events in it. They're shaped like a diamond. And you basically just want to use wisp trails and enemies to triangulate where you are in the diamond, whether you're at the top, bottom, or one of the sides. And then you just try to go around the diamond and engage with each event. Sometimes you get the vendors. They're basically worthless. Sometimes you get some of the crappy events. That's not great. But sometimes you get the good events. That's good, too. Ultimately, you want yellow and blue wisps, but you don't really have a lot of control over it. You take what you can get. Purple is the weakest wisp type on its own. It just gives rarity, which is less valuable than quantity or adding more currency. But it does add projectiles, which is great for abyss. So they're all pretty good. Ideally, you want to get a blend of all three. They do multiply with each other. So 5000 of like two or three of them spread across two or three of them, I mean, is better than just 5000 of one. Generally speaking, that is. Now, you want to look for white wisps while you're in the wildwood as well to grant more vision or refill your clear meter in the zone. The clear meter is hidden. It's not a thing that you can see. It just refills the amount of uh, exploration you have in there. You're not time gated either. Some people have noted that by playing on an ultra wide monitor or going into windowed mode and setting your resolution to be very wide, and just giving yourself more screen space to look around in, you can actually find a lot more white wisps and guarantee a lot more success in the in the wildwood on a consistent basis. This all makes sense for like maximizing your currency per hour. It's definitely a good strategy to do, but it seems very unfun. So I have chosen not to do it. But by all means, you have the knowledge now. You are burdened with this awful knowledge. You can use it, but I have not been. Ultimately, you want to kill as many enemies as you can while you're in the Wildwood. Enemies give a lot of juice as long as they're afflicted by the Wisps. This is why we like the pack size sextants and just any of the sextants to add more guys. Once the portal to the back to the map basically opens, you want to go back and pick up all of the Wisps that you left along the sides of the path. Uh, in exploring the Wildwood. High-end juicers won't do a map if it has like less than 5,000 juice. Some of them that cutoff is more like six or 7,000. I still do the low juice maps. I just try to zoom through them. I know it's not as good in terms of currency per hour. So if you really want to optimize, I do think that is a good rule to follow. Don't do any maps that have, I mean, a bare minimum of 3,000 juice, but maybe more like four or five. But I'm okay with just having a crappy map here and there. That's not a problem for me. Once I've done the Wildwood, cleaned it all out as well as I can, I zone out and I do the map. And doing the map really just means clearing through to the end. I skip all the league mechanics along the way. I skip the Abysses, Strongbox, Legions. I try to skip the rituals, but sometimes I still stop and do them. 
and I try to activate all the blue altars as quickly as I can. I basically always take the player choice. The only time I would ever not take the player choice is if I got insanely lucky and got a divine minion shrine, but that hasn't happened yet. And then, you know, you clear out the map. It's clear. As to whether you do the boss or not is up to you. It depends on your build. I usually skip the boss unless the juice is super low or if I have a ritual in the boss room. I still run in there and clear out the mobs, but if she's taking a while, I will just like zone out or log out. If you're stuck in the boss's room, like let's say you get kind of soft locked in there, you got to build like the one I'm playing that's really taking a long time to kill her. She's not dying and you're just like bored in there, you can just log out like a hardcore player who's afraid to die. <laughs> you could just log out and then log back in and go back around the map and pick up anything else with your portal that's not in the boss's room. That's why I think unless you're killing the boss, I prefer not to set a portal in the boss's room unless I've already cleared out the entire map, including the league mechanics, I'm totally done. And I go into the boss's room and she's taking a while, I will just portal out in that case. But otherwise I try to never set a portal in her room because I don't want to get soft locked in there. Doing one boss every 28 maps to get your Eldritch Invitation is a good idea. Technically speaking, you can take all of your Watchstones out and just do a different map entirely for that 28th map to get your... I mean, you could do like a Mesa, just boss rush the Mesa, kill the boss very quickly and get your invitation and then go back to doing this strategy the legit way. I think that is an approach I've used a couple of times and it's worked out pretty well for me. Okay, once you've cleared the map and activated all the blue altars, it's time to deal with the league mechanics that you've left up. So you want to go back and clear out all the rituals. Sometimes I do those along the way. Clear out any remaining red beasts, clear out any remaining harbingers. And, you know, if it's strongbox or legion, you basically just activate the strongboxes or the legions, kill the guys that come from them. That's pretty much it. Abyss is quite a bit more complicated. This is why most people don't love Abyss, and I include myself among them, but it's super rewarding, so it is worth the annoyance. Basically, you activate the Abyss, you walk onto it and then follow it around, and keep engaging with it until it turns into a Stygian Spire. Once that happens, you immediately want to disengage. You try to get about a screen away from it or so, and the Stygian Spire will spawn and start throwing out guys. Sometimes they can be a little buggy, sometimes they will like pop up visually, but they won't have a health bar, they won't engage, and you might need to walk back close to them to make it engage and then immediately get away again. The Stygian Spire has a health pool, and that but basically there are two ways to kill it. You can DPS it directly, which you don't want to do, or you can kill the mobs it spawns. And killing the mobs it spawns lowers its health. It's kind of like Harbingers, except you wish you couldn't DPS the Spires. The Spires will launch out projectiles, and each projectile it shoots spawns a rare mob. This is why plus two proj on maps is so valuable, because the increased effect of map mods passives in our Atlas tree boosts that up to plus three, and Purple Wish Juice can boost it even further. If you kill the mobs and don't do literally any damage to the Spires at all, four or five abysses in a map can add an insane amount of rares, like literally hundreds of rares to a map. This can be really difficult to pull off, especially with the build that I'm playing, because sometimes you'll get an explosion chain and that ignites the spire and kills it, and that just is the way that it is. It happens, it's okay. Ideally, you want to give the spires a bit of personal space. You kill a couple of waves of rares and maybe you get a conversion mob out of the deal and now you're rich. Once that's done, you just repeat it for every abyss in the map, gather any loot you might have left behind, do like one last tour of the map just to make sure you didn't miss anything, and then that's... That's it, do it again. That's pretty much all there is to the strategy. Now, normally this is where I would do a live demonstration, but this isn't a quick map strategy at all. You know, 20 minute average map time, and I would like for this video to be under an hour, so I'll do that as a separate video. I did put in a ton of example footage throughout this video, so for some people that might be enough, but I'm gonna make a narrated walkthrough anyway, because it sounds like it would be fun to do that of a magic find map. And yeah, that's gonna be the next thing I work on. I'm probably gonna work on that immediately after I finish this. So keep your eyes peeled for that coming soon if you are interested. Other than that, this is how I've been magic finding. It's been a lot of fun. I've had some pretty amazing loot explosions. It's been a really, really good change of pace. I am loving Affliction League. I finally found a squire, not a white socket oppressor, like an actual squire. That's pretty cool. I think I'm gonna probably try to make some sort of low budget build around it. All right, before I finish up, let's talk Turkey. How much currency have I actually made doing this strategy? 
I haven't liquidated literally any of the thousands of scarabs I've farmed, which PoE stack has listed at like 175 or 180 divines. I have not been keeping meticulous logs of how much currency I've made. I've basically just been vibing, but I made, I think around 500 divines in the past 10 days or so while only playing a few hours each day. Some days I haven't played at all. And then basically I spent all of that putting together an upcoming lightning strike champion build over the last couple of days i don't really feel like saying an exact currency per hour number is great with an rng heavy strategy like this i feel fine saying it about something that's creating a like a guaranteed amount of currency but you would probably feel misled if you didn't hit like let's say i make 75 divines an hour doing this strategy and i say you can make 75 you would be feel misled if you only made at 50 and i think that would be fair there are a lot of variables in this strategy your magic find gear exactly how much you invest in this strategy how much whips juice you get how well you handle the abysses and so on that really can fluctuate how much you make but i will say this i am making far more than i have ever ever made in any league before doing any strategy i had the liquidity to drop 500 divines on a lightning strike champion build that would not have been possible without doing this strategy so I say, take this as a call to action. Do this strategy. Let me know how much you're making. And if you make any changes that make this setup more profitable or more fun to play, I would genuinely like to hear them because I, I will probably do them myself. And I mean, I might even talk about it on a video. And of course, if you have any questions, I am very happy to answer those as well. All right, that's it. Thanks for watching and have fun getting rich. Bye.